Thank you, Sharon. All right, well, it is time for our forum to begin. So let me welcome everyone to the very first ever Home Baking Association Baking Innovations Forum. Today's topic is Bake and Take. And we're going to have several speakers for you today. And I'm going to start by turning it over to Charlene Patton, who is the Executive Director of Home Baking Association. And she's broadcasting tonight from Topeka, Kansas. So take it away, Charlene. Oh, wait, let, me, let me do a couple housekeeping things uh, before I get started. We will have a couple of polls uh, throughout the, the session. And I'm going to ask you to put your answers in the chat because we don't have an actual poll function for this meeting. Um, but when we get there, I will instruct you on, on how to proceed. So Charlene, take it away. All right, thank you, Tom. We wanna welcome everyone on behalf of the Home Baking Association and three of our members that are going to help present this forum tonight on Bake and Take and Baking Innovations for 2022. A little bit about the Home Baking Association. We're a nonprofit association. We have 34 members um, that are dedicated to providing resources for educators. And for us, an educator may be in the classroom, it may be in the community, could be a parent that's teaching Boy Scouts 4-H, Anyone can be an educator and we want to help them with resources. As you look at these logos here, these are the members that fund the Home Baking Association. So we ask you to support them because they believe in you and wanna provide resources and do everything they can to help you. When you look at those members, those are not only corporations and you'll see brands, but we also have state WE commissions, such as the Kansas WE Commission is with us tonight. Our other members that we want to recognize are our partners. We have seven partners that really support the Home Baking Association and allow us an opportunity to provide them resources and information as well. And we re really ask for their support as well too. And our new category is for associate members. You'll see there we have two, Baker Betty and Bigger Boulder Baking. Anyone that's a chef, a blogger, an author, we welcome them to become a part of the Home Baking Association. Contact us for information if that fits into an area that you would like to be a part of our association. At this time, I'm excited to present to you our program that we have, and we're gonna start out with our first poll question. Tom, do you wanna tell us about it? Sure, so we'd like to know a little bit about you, particularly why do you bake? So in the chat, please list the reasons that you bake. Uh, we've got some suggestions here for you, such as teaching in school or teaching in a cooperative extension program or 4-H, uh, part of your early childhood or childcare program. Uh, whatever your reasons are, put them in the chat and I'll be taking a look at those while our first speaker is presenting. And I'll come back to you with some results a little bit later. So with that, let me turn it over to our first speaker tonight. Uh, and that is Cindy Falk from Kansas Wheat. She's a nutrition educator there at Kansas Wheat in Manhattan, Kansas. And she's gonna tell us a little bit about Bake and Take. So take it away, Cindy. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. And um, I wanted to talk about Bake and Take. The Bake and Take mission is to create homemade community goodwill. In the early days, Bake and Take started as an adult activity and it has evolved into a family activity. It brings families together to have fun baking. And we experienced bakers can help young bakers improve their skills. I think it's a wonderful way to help youth think beyond their own interests. It is a good citizen, hands-on learning project. And the, you know, there's happiness for those giving and receiving the baked product. And I always like to tell people to remember that the personal visit is as rewarding as the delicious baked gift. Another goal is to help build awareness of our locally produced wheat. 
baking ingredients, and baking tools. And finally, Bake and Take promotes the enjoyment of wheat foods for everyone. I enjoyed looking through boxes of history for these slides. And so I hope you will enjoy hearing about Bake and Take Day history. I'd like for you to travel back in time with me to the 1970s. Ladies, imagine that you are in Kansas and your husband attends a wheat growers meeting. And you just decide to ride along with him and you meet up with other wheat farmer wives. Well, you decide to form your own group and you call yourselves the Kansas Sweethearts. Then you come up with this fantastic idea to bake for people in the community, such as those in nursing homes, housebound individuals, or just anyone who would appreciate a baked item and a visit. And so Bake and Take Day, celebrated on the fourth Saturday in March, began. And the concept was so successful, it was expanded to National Bake and Take Month. And now, 50 years later, it's been all about baking something special for someone special. Not only did the Kansas Sweethearts and the Wheat Farmers promote Bake and Take Day, but others such as State Departments of Ag's Office on Aging and Meals on Wheels endorsed the idea too. Uh, they used their manual typewriters and they wrote to letters to all the governors of all 50 states to encourage them to make it official and proclaim the fourth Saturday of March as Bake and Take Day. Other partners soon joined the efforts, including the National Wheat Foods Council and the Home Baking Association. Um, at the grassroots level, Bake and Take Day became an annual activity for extension, youth organizations and local clubs, and all the bakers strongly agreed that helping others never tasted so good. This poem, Why Not, was written by Frida Worthington, a charter member of the Kansas Sweethearts. And looking through the history and all the boxes that we inherited, um, this poem appeared in many of the earlier Bake and Take Day brochures. Why not? Is there someone near you? Someone who's all alone? Why don't you try the Wheat Heart plan and call them on the phone? Just tell them you'll be over and bring them bread or cake and give to them a cheery smile and you've done bake and take. From these humble beginnings, Bake and Take Day grew over the years. It started as a local project in Sumner County, and that's the number one wheat producing county in Kansas. The next year, the Wheat Hearts asked the Kansas governor to proclaim the fourth Saturday in March as Bake and Take Day. It was very successful, and in 1973 was promoted by governors in 17 states. Even North Dakota's first lady got involved. A newspaper clipping showed her baking loaves of bread in her kitchen for Bake and Take Day in 1974. The newly formed Wheat Foods Council endorsed Bake and Take Day and in 1975 it was observed in 19 states. In 1977, our Kansas governor requested all 50 states proclaim the fourth Saturday in March as Bake and Take Day. Deliveries in the, were in the thousands that year, not only from Kansas bakers, but also from individuals as far as way, as far away as California. In addition, Representative Keith Sebelius submitted US Congress Resolution 89 to make a national bake and take day observance. 
During the next decade, the Kansas Sweethearts, Kansas Sweet Commission, Wheat Foods Council members, Extension, and Home Baking Association continued to observe this special day. And looking back, 2008 was an unforgettable year because the one day observance was enlarged to a national bake and take month. And I remember 2009 was an exciting year because we had a new retail sponsor for National Bake and Take Month promotion. Clubs and individuals shared Goodwill and home baked products with hundreds of Kansans in 2011. The Home Baking Association and Kansas Sweet that year provided book bundles for prizes that included Baking with Friends, written by Charlene Patton and Sharon Davis. And also we offered our Kansas Gold History and Recipe books. Well, then came COVID-19 and instead of a personal visit, we wore a face mask when delivering the baked treat and left a handwritten note. The timeline brings us to today's Baking Innovations 2022 Bake and Take live Zoom forum and reaching out to new target audiences and social media with social media, print, radio, and TV. So what does the future look like? Well, I just encourage you to promote Bake and Take to a new generation and bake for those in need. What better way to show concern than by a gift of baked goods and a personal visit? Bake and Take Day blends well with service learning, home, community, career, and culinary. Uh, baking fits learning at home, in classrooms, after school clubs, and science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics education. Organizations and individuals enjoy Bake and Take Day as a community service project. While they learn creative new baking ideas, recipes and techniques. This project can also teach the principles of food science, portion sizes, whole grain baking, food safety and nutrition. And if bakers want to get creative, they can design their own food labels and use new bio-friendly food packaging. Bake and Take sponsors can tell their story and introduce consumers to baking brand leaders. So looking back, why has Bake and Take flourished for 50 years? Well, I think it's because it has wide appeal as a way to share love for your fellow man. It fosters satisfaction for the baker and builds that goodwill in the community. It has flourished because of a variety of bakers and partners that have participated. And I found this photo that you can see in the photo, you might recognize former First Lady of the United States, Pat Nixon, and standing next um, to her is our longtime Senator from Kansas, Bob Dole. In the beginning, the Kansas Sweethearts worked so hard to publicize their event with typewritten press releases and letters. And I was thinking back, wouldn't they be surprised of how the internet and social media can spread the word faster and farther than they could have ever imagined. Another key element of Bake and Take Day has been recognizing individuals and groups who participated. Uh, with, we gave them certificates, prizes such as bread machines, yeast, gift uh, gift cards and cash prizes. So looking back, what has worked for us? Um, as you can see in the photo, Bake and Take Day publicity 
was based on a lot of brochures and press releases. Then it seemed like we branched out into radio and TV promotion and then partnerships with national organizations and retailers helped to expand Bake and Take even more. I really feel that the incentives and recognition kept the bakers interested in participating year after year. Now, how can you help ensure the great tradition lives on? Well, you can help sponsor Bake and Take Month in March in your local areas. Or why not join forces with other interested bakers, organizations, businesses, or us? You may want to broaden the scope and share baked goods throughout the year, as the Wheatheart president suggested in 1974. Carol Torline said, people are doing baking and taking, not only on the designated day, but throughout the year as well. Another quote that I like is from my friend, Joe Eva McQuellen, one of the original Kansas sweethearts. And she said, we're such a processed, fast food, instant nation, that we've forgotten the satisfaction of using our hands to make something. Well, I hope by now you're inspired to participate in Bake and Take Month. Here are some steps to get started. Just think about who you know that would accept a baked treat and a visit. And make sure you ask about dietary restrictions and bake a test kitchen reliable recipe. Apply baking food safety steps in preparation and handling your baked treat. Then label your baked item with your name, date, and list of ingredients. Package your baked items in user-friendly and earth-friendly packaging. And make sure to call or text before delivering and finally, introduce yourself at the door when you deliver something special for someone special on the 50th anniversary of Bake and Take. Okay, thank you, Cindy. So we're now up to our second poll, but before I ask you to put those answers into the chat, I just wanted to share with you the summary of our first poll and Many of you bake for home, family, and community. Six of you are teaching in school. Uh, five of you either uh, bake for extension or 4-H or some other type of community engagement. Uh, two of you are judges at either state or county fairs and one person bakes for work. So that's great. So our second poll question, please put your answer into the chat. What do you like to bake for others the most? And with that, I will turn it over to our next speaker. We have a real special treat in store for you because we have a real live chef with us tonight. Chef Stephanie Peterson is the corporate executive chef for Panhandle Milling, and she's broadcasting tonight from Snowflake, Arizona. Stephanie? So uh, Tom, we have four of Cindy's vintage recipes. If we can just cover those first. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, excuse me, yeah, and the, Cindy, the uh, I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry, <Cindy>. <laughs> well, I talked, uh, I mentioned that I looked through boxes and boxes of um, bake and take day information. And I had a list of about 50 different recipes that I, I want to try, but, um, I will share with you four vintage bake and take recipes that were included in the early brochures. Um, these recipes can be found at homebaking.org bake and take uh, recipes. The first is honey wheat bread, which is from 1973. Now the original recipe was just stirred up in a mixing bowl with a wooden spoon and kneaded by hand. Well, I updated the recipe by using my time-saving stand mixer and the dough hook. And the main ingredients are bread flour and yeast, cottage cheese, honey, whole wheat flour, oats, and walnuts. 
And since this makes about three and a half pounds of dough, it is really a great recipe for gift giving. And as shown in the picture, I made some smaller loaves and also used the dough to make um, cinnamon rolls. The next recipe is whole wheat sugar cookies. And this recipe appeared in one of the very first bake and take day brochures in 1973. And you know, it's still an all time favorite. I like to use white whole wheat flour in the recipe, which is um, a whole grain flour milled from a wheat variety that is lighter in color. And often in recipes calling for whole wheat flour, I substitute white whole wheat flour one for one. And oh, the orange zest and the nutmeg and the dough and the cinnamon and sugar topping adds a pleasing flavor to these whole grain cookies. And this recipe is an entry at many of our county fairs. Um, the next recipe I found is this um, is an easy fudge nut bar cookie recipe from 1980. And I think that was a great find in the Wheat Gleanings newsletter. The cookie dough's main ingredients are all purpose flour and oats. And then it has a layer of fudge, which is chocolate chips, sweetened condensed milk, butter, nuts, and vanilla. And so it is a rich treat. So I cut it in smaller serving sizes after we took this photo. Um, I also made the recipe and used uh, low fat sweetened condensed milk and milk chocolate chips and that worked just fine. And you could also use part white whole wheat flour. And the last recipe um, that I like from these older brochures is a pumpkin bran muffin recipe. And it appeared in 1991 in the Bake and Take with Wheat Foods brochure, which was sponsored by the Kansas Sweet Commission and the Wheat Foods Council. And of course, the main ingredients are 100% whole bran cereal, pumpkin, all-purpose flour, raisins, and spices that are probably in every kitchen cupboard. Okay, now, now it's time for Chef <laughs> Tess or her Chef Stephanie Peterson of Panhandle Milling. Um, she is broadcasting, as I said, from Snowflake, Arizona. So sorry about that, Cindy, and take it away, Stephanie. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I am really excited to be here today. And uh, just a really quick, uh, quick note that I'm going to going to share here is that I we're going to show these slides pretty quickly. I'm going to just talk through them and then we're going to switch to um, to live screen and, and then I'm going to actually show you some examples of, of what I've been working on here in my kitchen over the last day or so. So you can actually see um, these examples in in real time in real life. So um, as as I'm talking through these, you can you'll be able to actually see the real deal as these are going through. Um, I do want to say something as, as I'm talking here. Um, I had the, the amazing opportunity to, to be a judge at the National Festival of Breads with Cindy. And it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. Um, this, this bake and take concept is, is just like the culmination. I'm, I'm a gift giver and I don't know if a lot of you are on that, but that's my, that's my love language and it has been like my whole life. And, and my mom is a food science. Um, she was her, her degree is, is food science with a minor in home ec education. And so the whole time I was growing up, it was kind of like, okay, Stephanie, how can you improve this? How can you make it better? But she learned bread from her mother. And then, and when my mom went off to college, she came home and said, mom, you can tweak this and this and that. And her mom didn't say, you got Miss Smarty Pants in college. She said, okay, I'll learn what you, I'll take what you taught, uh, what you learned and improve my skills. And, and I, I feel like that the, at the innovations and things that we learn from generation to generation, if we, as, as educators and, 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 and people can just
keep it going and, and improve on one another and not go, oh, don't be a smarty pants. We can just go, okay, this is great. Let's let's improve on each other's mad skills and, and move forward and learn from the generations and and like, you know, that that saying, if you know, I see further, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants and just go, okay, let's help those younger ones just go and cheer them forward and make that the thing that we do, that that is what the HBA is all about. And, and as I see that um, working with HBA, the opportunities that this has brought for me, it's just been phenomenal. So I'm excited to be here. That's, that's my little, I'm super excited. So um, what I'm here to do is take these um, experiences I have as a as a chef, I've been a chef, a pastry chef for 27 years, um, work in the R&D department with, with our company as a corporate executive chef. And I've done phenomenal and exciting things through that 27 years um, on a grand scale, um, but simple and dynamic and creative ways to help these kids and you as an adult and educators to say, okay, now we have this core recipe. We're not going to mess with something that is already awesome because Cindy and her team at Kansas Wheat, they've already come up with this program that is awesome. We don't have to fix that. We don't have to fix it. It's not broken. We don't have to fix it. But what can we do and to help these kids go, ah, okay, let's help them to be creative. Let's help them connect with their culinary genius. And that's one thing that my mom did. I was, I, I'm a very tactile little chef. And she said, okay, Stephanie, um, what... I, I would always go, I don't want my, I don't want my stuff to touch. I didn't want my stuff to touch when I was a kid. And she, and she'd say, Stephanie, that is a genius. And instead of like, like trying to make me like squelch my genius, she'd say, okay, I know you don't like those different flavors to touch, but let's recognize those flavors and help you to connect those flavors and make them something different and something cool and maybe make those flavors into something. And so that's what we're going to try to help kids do is connect those genius things that they can do. So as I'm talking about these things, let's help kids to recognize their genius things that they can do and grow and expand and be amazing. Cause that's what we're doing. That's what we're here to do. Help kids recognize their genius. Um, so one of those things that I like to do is um, find some simple and dynamic and creative ways to help them do that. Chefs will do, pastry chefs will do glazes on cakes and rolls. Um, this is a very common thing, melting um, jellies, glazes, um, very, very, very common. Um, so I'm going to show you some of that, and, and that will be coming up pretty quick. Um, the next thing, I can go to the next slide, is to infuse sugars, to use, this is, this is the very, the, a big one that's coming up right now, infused sugars in, and infused salts. Um, that's, I didn't put that on there, but you can do that caveat in your notes infused salts, those are a big one right now. Um, using freeze-dried fruits and fruit powders in their roll-ins, um, that is happening in a, a really remarkable way. People wanna add flavor, like bold, wild flavors without adding um, a lot of artificial anything, um, especially the plant-based revolution. Um, vegan, the vegan movement is ginormous right now and healthy. Um, without adding a lot of added um, sugars or um, artificial flavors. So the freeze-dried and fruit, fruit powders are ginormous right now. And that's not going to go away. That is just a real fact of life. Um, concentrated flavored oils, and those are natural oils. That's also something that is really trending really big right now. And that's something that um, I'm going to give you information about as well. Um, using citrus zest. Um, and, and I'm not here to um, change anybody's minds about citrus zest. That's just something that pastry chefs have used forever. It's a concentrated source of flavor and just some fun ways to incorporate that into your baked goods without changing anything at all. Um, adding spice blends into your the profile of your syrups. Um, and that is something that I, as a pastry chef, have used in crazy weird cool ways as just a finish for my sauces and my and my pastry and my pastries in the restaurants and in my bake shop. Um, one of my um, most most common ones is using like cayenne in my caramel syrup, and people would just freak out and get super excited about it. And I don't know why, but that was like one of my trendy things. And then the last slide, 
really quick. Um, just some ways to save a little bit of money, which is always good as we are educators, is um, homemade everything topping um, and everything topping changes everything. It's pretty big. It hasn't gone away. Um, and it just does change the flavor dynamic of pretty much anything you put it on because it adds all that flavor and it's a big pal. So um, that and then pesto and herb dipping of the rolls before you raise them. And then also as they're baked or even after they're baked, putting that pesto or herb dips on your, on your rolls. Um, and then I am also gonna go through the flavor profiles that are very common for changing those flavor profiles of rolls, um, the baked goods for sure. And then um, show you some painting of buns and breads that make beautiful, beautiful um, flair for your baked goods without changing, of course, the core of that roll. So that being said, should we get on to the live demo part of that? Yeah, before you do that, Stephanie, there is a question for you in the chat going back to glazes. Yes. What would you glaze? Oh, I just lost it. What would you glaze uh, a pumpkin muffin with? What flavor? Well, um, we'll talk about that right now. So I have, let me get my stuff out right here. We'll talk about it. So I have some muffins that I've done. So one of the ways to change any of the flavor profiles of a muffin or a tiny little cake is to either put like some kind of different topping in it before it bakes or to add that glaze that I just talked about. Um, very common would be to melt down like some plum jam. Um, in the Southwest, one of my, one of my favorites is to use, um, I use a lot, a lot, it's almost embarrassing how much a lot of um, prickly pear jam. I use for mine, um, but these ones I made on Monday. This is a pump. This is a pecan pumpkin, little tiny pan. These were like little mini ones, but that was put on Monday and look how still super glossy and yummy those look and they're delicious, right? So when you do those, um, any of the dried fruit that you put on, you can still see that glaze add such a ton of flavor and it's like a nice floral touch and it can be done. Um, you take that just regular, just make sure you're not putting anything obviously metal. Don't put the, um, I made that mistake once and I never did it again. But once this has been in the reheated, once it's been heated, it will melt to like a liquid, but um, it's like that jelly just like makes a nice normal glaze. And you can literally, um, anything that's like a jelly jelly will make a nice glaze for anything. Um, another thing is when you're doing like the fillings for any of your cinnamon rolls, you can really change the dynamic of those flavors by doing the, um, the freeze dried fruits and those um, flavor powders. So when I did like the rolls, when I did my rolls, like my bear claws, the, just the powdered um, freeze dried blackberries. Um, these ones happen to be um, cinnamon. Gosh, what is the word? <laughs> oh, my brain just went blank. Okay, this was purple carrots from my house. So I made a purple carrot um, cake rolls. And then this, this just made the shape. Huh? So you can totally change the dynamics just by adding those flavors and contrast and then that glaze. So it's really pretty and simple and just changing the shape of the inside. Um, doing that glaze, you can also use it to add dynamic, um, pretty things to the tops of your cakes. This is sage and some candied violet to the top of, of a whole wheat pound cake. So you see how you can just use that glaze to actually put those beautiful touches on the top of those take and bake things for your delicious things. This has also got some um, lavender, not lavender, that's thyme. So just adding like that personal touch to something that you're doing, easy to do. Also, um, the freeze dried fruits 
also can really add, um, as far as the take and bake things, it adds a, a level of where it's really safe to take without adding um, gooiness, um, which is nice. So I have like the freeze dried um, pineapple on here and the black walnuts and then some candy ginger. So it's almost like a, um, on my sticky buns, it almost adds like this tart, sweet, gingered, tropical taste to my sticky buns, which is really nice to counter if you have a really sweet sticky bun, like a tropical flavor to that. So that's some ideas for the whole wheat rolls. Now, okay. <laughs> I have a lot of things that I baked. Crazy. Okay, so the next thing is for the um, the pumpkin. So we talked about the pumpkin. Other ideas for those would be um, doing some different. This is not pumpkin. So that is just a like a pink strawberry cake, but then adding like the freeze dried strawberries on top and some thyme, and then some dried saffron, but then just adding when you do your, um, your glaze or your sauce, um, you, you don't have to buy, like, you don't have to make like your own syrups, but when I made my, my, did my syrup, it was like a, I can't even see it, white Ghirardelli's, and I added just a little bit of lavender to that syrup. And then when I sprinkle it on, okay, pretend it went on before I take that on, that helps add some succulents and some depth of good flavor to that. So then there's that sweetness and niceness to that strawberryness. Stephanie, okay. I have a question. Do you have a preferred or recommended source for the fruit powders? Yes, um, it's NorthBayTradingCompany.com. And that's I think that's one of the resources that I listed. Um, those will be available that in that resource section that we list here at the end of this, at this um, forum. forum. Yes. So um, another one of the sources of another thing I love with the freeze dried um, bananas is that if you put regular fresh bananas on any of your products, you're going to have brown bananas pretty quick, right? But the freeze dried ones do not brown. So I can put like bananas and chocolate and freeze dried strawberries and I can take them anywhere and they're just, they're going to be good for a couple of days and not have a problem. So here I have the pumpkin made into a bunt, a bunt, little bunt cake with some honey that I put a little bit of, of like um, cayenne pepper in. So it's like at the sweet and the hot and then the bananas. And then, then it's just like this delicious flavor contrast. And it's just really pretty and fun and like, ooh, yummy. And by the way, always like consider your audience. I'm not going to take this to a kindergartner. They will not care. But if this is like somebody that I'm trying to woo for my, um, my, um, chapter of my FCCLA that we're like, we're trying to get sponsors for our, our kids that want to go to the national convention. Okay. Then yes, this is who you would take this one to. Right. Okay. Just saying. Okay. Or, you know, your mother-in-law. Um, same thing with like the freeze dried strawberries. I'm using the, um, the Hammond's black walnuts. These are American black walnuts, totally different flavor than the English walnuts. And I really like them. They are like really earthy, a lot stronger and amazing. So if you're gonna use like a walnut or a flavor that is different. Um, also, if you are taking, they can take to somebody, make sure they, if they don't have a nut allergy, um, if you're taking something that has obvious nuts. So something to be aware of as you're doing, they can take this as well. So, um, and lastly, um, this one is a caramel and a pecan but the caramel has an infusion of black pepper. So also just a really fun, different idea for those. Okay. So Chef Tess. Yes, did you how, see it? How, how about different nuts? Yes, different nuts. Yeah, what kind of flavor profiles or what do you do with nuts when you do use them that might um, give you a twist? That's good. Okay, so a lot of times I will toast them with a spice um, and make sure that it, I toast them I toast them first and then add the spice at the very end. 
Um, and if I do add any herbs to that, that they have an herb that has a more licorice profile to it than a savory profile, if it's going to be on a baked good that's a sweet baked good. Um, for a really long time, people kind of like steered away from adding herbs to their sweet baked goods, but recently those have, that has changed. Um, thyme and basil especially are coming to be something that people really are using on a lot of their sweet baked goods. So something to keep in mind, especially if you're adding those nuts, if you're gonna add fat and add a little add, add fat with flavor, um, I really like doing that and, and especially toasting those. And those ham and black walnuts, Hammond's black walnuts, those America, that American black walnut just has a, a totally complex, different flavor profile than a lot of the other nuts that I've seen out there. Okay, the next thing that I'm gonna talk about is the, sorry, the infused sugars. Okay, I gotta get rid of some of this stuff on my table. Here. So, um, how's my time here? Okay, we're getting quick. Okay, infused sugars. Um, when I do the infused sugars, I use the whole, um, I'll use a lot of times, I'll use the whole cardamom pods in mine. Um, that's very Danish, Scandinavian flavor profile to it. Also, a lot of people will use, um, a lot of people do cinnamon sugar all the time. Cinnamon sugar is very, everybody does it, but something that's really trending right now is the specula spice. Um, that is a very complex Dutch, Profile, it has all the other spices in there too, plus citrus usually. And it just adds a whew, big flavor profile to it. I really love that one. Um, if I'm doing powdered sugar, putting powdered sugar on something of mine, I will also add um, any number of, of powdered flavor additions to it. Um, there's a, a brand of, of powder flavors that I really like. It's called, there's, it's called Natural Flavors. Um, they have Amaret, they have all different kinds of flavors, but um, check out that, that website. They have just awesome flavors that you can add to those, those, spice, those powders that you're doing. Um, people will get, spend a ton of money on like vanilla infused sugars and things like that. One thing that I have found is that's not something you necessarily have to do. Those are super expensive and it's just, it feels like it's a waste of money to me just because it's something you can do pretty inexpensively just by adding those whole spices to your sugar and just letting them sit for about a week. That flavor just goes right through the sugar and it will hold pretty well. I also like to say um, in, it's, it's not too far-fetched to just get these like vanilla bean powders, um, Amazon carries them. It just takes about a teaspoon to put in a quart, I mean, not a quart, about two cups of powdered of, of regular sugar. And that will take on that whole flavor profile of this. This was about nine bucks and this was about nine bucks. And this will make about a gallon of powdered sugar, of, of sugar infused. So um, if you're spending money, spend it wisely. And then you can have money to do other things like buy shoes. You know, okay. Um, for those those uh, zests, one of my absolute favorite favorite fun ones to do is just add like zest to the tops of, of rolls and things that people wouldn't normally think of. Um, lime zest on my cornbread, one of my absolute favorites. People just go, "What lime cornbread?" I'm like, "Dude, it's so good and it's so easy to do." Um, lime zest is one of those like least used but most amazing ones to add a different alternative flavor to. Um, and one of those things to teach those kids in your classes. Um, one of the one of the things that I, the, my, one of my favorite phone calls that I got from one of my students was, um, Steph, I'm at the grocery store. What is zest? Where do you find that in the store? I can't find it anywhere. <laughs> and I was like, mm, okay, go to the produce section. I want you to pick up an orange. Yeah, see that? color on the orange yeah that's the zest part and she was like what like her brain was like gonna explode she was freaking out so okay make sure your students know that that's what that is so um spice blends blah 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 flavored salts so flavored salts you're gonna people can spend will spend tons of money on these flavors and they don't need to like this truffle salt that i got was like 30 something bucks because i like truffle but um, you don't have to spend that kind of money. Even like celery salt, when they make celery salt, all that is, is the ground up celery seeds mixed with salt. And so you can make those flavored salts 
just by adding ground up herbs and spices to those salts and get those same kind of flavor, boom, just by adding those two salts. Um, and those just sprinkled a little bit on the tops of oiled rolls, like, you know, butter on top and then a little sprinkle of those flavors will absolutely totally change the dynamics of those, those things very quickly. So um, we're gonna go to this last part, changing those flavor profiles pretty quick. We have no, no time left. We're gonna go really fast. Um, I did some, oops. This part's fun. So I have some they're kind of raising. I'm gonna show you. So there's some regular like dinner rolls, right? They have the pesto and like the cheese and the flavor profiles. And by the way, um, there will be all this information available to you that has like, okay, what my basic dill pesto recipe and um like the basic, like what are the herbs and spices that work together so that as kids are like trying to explore these flavors, they're not like, oh, I put the wrong flavor together and I put cinnamon with the basil and it's nasty. Okay, I'm gonna give you all the ones that work together in the basic profiles. So nobody like freaks out and does something like, and then they're afraid to ever make something again. Or maybe they feel and they learn. That's always good too, but I don't know. The first time I made spaghetti pizza for my brother, I put too much, too much. Anyway, oh, long and short. You learn and then either your brother punches you in the face or, you know, okay. Anyway, pesto, these things, okay. Um, these ones, raise and bake. We did the pesto sauce on them and baked them and then they ended up like this. And these are the ones my husband's not going to let me take anywhere else because he loves them. So this had gargonzola cheese and the Hammond's black walnuts and we added the, so I like to add some of the stuff before I bake it. And then before I take it, I add some more because then it's uber pretty and people eat with their eyes. So I do a little bit more of the fresh herbs before I take it to somebody to serve it to them because that's what chefs do. They want gorgeous things, right? That's okay to do gorgeous things. Okay. The next one that we did was a little Mexican version where I did some chorizo seasoning on there, which chorizo is like, like the most delicious, like I make chorizo sausage and it's like got this like awesome, like fajita type flavoring. And then I did lime zest, um, garlic, and some cilantro and some cheddar cheese, hmm? right? Would you eat those rolls? Oh my gosh, yes, right? Okay. And then I did a French version where we did some dill, um, some goat cheese, some, um, what's the yellow one? Oh yeah, lemon, lemon, yeah, quick. Okay, I'm almost out of time. Okay, and then we did some, this one is a Greek one with feta and olives and all the things. Okay, so go get all that information. Okay, am I out of time? Are we out of time? We're getting there. Okay. <laughs> so the very last thing that we did was some painted bread. Painted bread, I'm gonna show you that really quick. So, and this one, is it gonna really love? So we did some sunflower breads. So little sunflower rolls. And then some little like flowers and like little things. Those are good, right? Okay. And the information for how to do those, um, well, it's in my book, but it's also on my website. Um, and we'll probably, we could probably do another form on that if we wanted to, but um, that is a really simple process. And most of that is done after it's baked, believe it or not. So that can even be done with bread um, that you bake and freeze and then have everybody over with all of their artsy crafty fun things. And it's a lot of just creativity with the whole crew. So that is what I have on just dynamic fun ways to add flavor and 
good things about changing the core recipes. And, and just one final thing I want to say is that um, this making and baking and taking, this is something that is done from heart to heart. And that's what this is. It's a legacy of love that we're sharing with, uh, with these people that we're teaching. And um, it's something that will go on. I hope that I'm like almost 50. You guys started this when I was just a tiny, tiny little one. And what a difference it it made and it has made and will make for generations to come. And I hope I look back when I'm a little old lady and sitting in there going, I can say, what a difference this 50, next 50 years. I wanna see what happens as this goes forward for the next 50 years. What a cool thing. So onward and upward we go, for sure. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> All right, Sharon, back to you. You're gonna put up the slide. There we go. There we go. So Stephanie, all I can say is absolutely stellar. I hate to go to anything else. It's so fun following you. You do such a beautiful job. You and Cindy are just awesome. Let me, Sharon, job. before you move, let me introduce you so everyone oh, knows who. Okay. <laughs> so Sharon Davis is uh, a family consumer sciences teacher and she's also a programming staff member at the Home Baking Association. And uh, I don't know what we do without her. So Sharon, take it away. Well, thank you, everybody. This is just a lot of fun. And um, yeah, we go way back, all of us do with this baking. Um, so here we go. I'm just gonna do a light touch on the food safety side of it. Not very sexy after you see all the stuff that Cindy and Chef Tess have been doing, but um, it's great for us to remember a few specifics. And we offer you some great links to online um, teaching resources. If, if you teach Serve Safe or you teach other food safety um, materials to eat or use at home, go and review what the baking food safety is all about, because it's mostly and especially about not eating raw product or having the raw product on your counter like batter, flour, dough, or on your hands and then going ahead and handling um, baked goods. So that's like you would do with hamburger and fruits and vegetables, you wouldn't cross contaminate. So here's another website that gives you some really great baking food safety connections. You've probably many of you heard of Fight Back. Well, this is their flour and home food safety. Um, page. So you want to check that out. And then our five messages for you tonight, along with the North American Millers Association and the Canadian Millers, is that first of all, flour is a raw ingredient because it's minimally processed. We keep it clean, we put it through the milling process, but it has not been necessarily freed of pathogens, although they're working on this. Um, as Stephanie can say, panhandle milling is one of those leaders who's working on working at the mill to reduce the pathogens. And so we are not so um, worried about raw flour. But meanwhile, we should all wash our hands before and after mixing and shaping raw dough. We should work with clean workstations. And I think this is a no brainer, but clean the, the, the counters first, then clean them after you crack your eggs and use your flour and you've mixed dough and batter. And finally, don't don't give in to that temptation to share the mixing spoon or the raw dough and the batter. Um, it really, as, as Fight Back says, just one lick can make you sick. So especially when you're working with young kids, don't tempt them with that wonderful prize of licking the um, beaters. Cook or bake everything to a safe temperature. And let me just show you what that means. It would mean that you would use a food thermometer. We have a great um, video on our website and so does ThermoWorks. And tonight they're launching with you a great um, opportunity to buy these Thermo Pops. You see the beautiful colors um, at a reduced half price. And you've got the offer right here. And on the resource guide, Charlene shares, she will have that offer uh, and this handout right here that you're looking at about heat as an ingredient. So we have our process temperatures like creaming and cutting in and water temperatures for yeast. Those are process temperatures. You take temperatures on those to be sure they're at the right temperature. But then when you bake, you can take internal temperatures to be sure your products are done. And these thermal pops are a digital thermometer. They're cute, but they're also like one of the best. 
They are um, a 10 year battery. They don't have to be calibrated like a dial thermometer. They are just a really good piece of gear. So give it a, give it a listen when you go to our website and then check out this great offer. Finally, when you're re delivering the products, you want something that is, if you want it to be earth friendly, then you want to check out this latest product uh, made by Good Natured Products. So Chef Tess had everything she had. These plastics are actually made without petroleum. They are biodegradable. They're made with an American crop called corn and um, they're made in North America, in Minnesota by a company um, that produces this pl plastic-like product. These renewable materials um, are also made without chemicals that concern us, such as BPAs. I'll just show you a quick um, look-see at some of the packaging they offer for baked goods. Lots of viz, lots of high, um, high space if you're going to yeah, frost. Really great. Um, and also um, muffins and other things can be packaged in individual containers as well. So there's a look, see at some of the packaging they offer. And again, it's called goodnaturedproducts.com. Um, and we're at our last poll question. Okay, great. So um, I put in the chat the results of our second poll question, which asked what you bake. And your answers tracked along with all sorts of research that HBA has seen over the years, cookies leading the pack, then yeast spreads, quick breads, donuts and cinnamon rolls, cakes, and one of you is brave enough to bake sourdough, so that's great. So our third and final poll question, what group or contact will you make in your community to bake and take? So you can put that into the chat. And also I put a note in the chat that if you have questions for any of our speakers, please put those questions in the chat as well, and they will be happy to answer them for you. So I'll give you a moment to do that. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to turn it over to Charlene Patton again, uh, Executive Director of Home Baking Association. She's going to talk to you about all the resources we've gathered for you and how you can get them. We hope you were not overwhelmed tonight with so many different ideas and recipes, but if you were, we have a resource sheet that we've provided on our website. If you go to our homepage, you'll see a link to our Bake and Take forum and it's filled with all the resources that were shown tonight. It has a resource link so that you can go to that and directly get to the recipes and all of Chef Tess's ideas and Cindy's recipes and information that um, Sharon provided on baking food safety. Also want to invite you to enter our educator award contest. All of you are doing amazing things wherever you're at tonight. And we would love to have you enter the Home Baking Association Educator Award Contest. Each year, our members provide $1,000 plus a trip to our annual meeting to share your baking activity or lesson. This year, that meeting is going to be in October and will be in Stowe, Vermont. The deadline for entering in it, either by mail or you can enter it online is March 31st. So go to our website for more information, but we'd love to honor one of you as this year's recipient. Also, if you look at this, you'll see that we want you to share what you've done. So if you're doing some bake and take things with your groups, please send those to us as well, because we'd love to reshare them, reshare your recipes and your ideas. Thank you, Charlene. So a lot of you have put a lot of great uh, bake and take activities that you plan to do. We don't have any questions for any of our speakers. So with that, we can adjourn unless anyone have any questions. I don't see um any. Tom, one more thing. Sharon was going to talk about if they enjoyed tonight, we want them to also That's right. take part in our next forum. And Sharon, do you want to give them a teaser about that? Because we'd love to have them join us again. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. On April 6th, we'll be hosting Celebrations Take Cake. You know, we've got spring coming and then uh, with that comes graduation parties as well as weddings, all kinds of celebrations. So join us for Celebrations Take Cake. We will have Chef Eleonora from the Domino Test Kitchen. She's their corporate chef. 
as well as um, Elizabeth Hagen, who is a award winner for our educator award and her entire lesson plan will be provided to you. And her lesson plan is all about cake too. So we hope you'll join us April 6th, spread the word. Um, again, I think you'll find it very valuable, whether you're teaching classroom or whether you're a home baker um, who works with kids and grandkids, or if you are also a professional, um, the corporate chef tips we have are always wonderful to go with. Thank you everybody for coming tonight. Thank you. And I just want to mention tonight's session was recorded. So if you want to see any of those delicious baked goods again, we'll post a link on our website and on our YouTube channel in the future. Thank you all for attending our very first baking forum. Thank you for being patient with us as we kind of muddled our way through figuring out how to do this virtually. And we look forward to seeing you at our next presentation.